Good morning. It's a nice to see each of you here today, and I'm so blessed and feel wonderful to be here with you today, having just spent a whirlwind week in Michigan helping my brother with some, some medical concerns and kind of an unexpected trip. So I wasn't even sure I'd be here this morning, so I'm relieved to, to be here, and I thank all of you who have helped over this last week and helped last Sunday. Um, you'll be seeing a sermon by Reverend Jim Keck today via video. Um, that's one thing I was not able to get done for you today, but I appreciate um, Bob helping to prepare to get that set up for us, and it is a really wonderful sermon, and so I'm looking forward to hearing it again um, with you and being together in worship with you today. Um, and this is, is our tradition. I just invite you now to take a moment, call to mind where it is that you encounter God in your own personal life over this past week. Perhaps it was something that you saw, maybe it was an encouraging word or something that somebody shared with you, a song that you heard, maybe something that you tasted or something that just brought to mind how God knows specifically what in your own life is meaningful for hope, encouragement. Call that to mind and then those who are interested in sharing, I'll bring the microphones around as we encourage each other. As you're taking a moment, this is a, also a wonderful time just to welcome those who are online, those joining live via Zoom, those who will join us later via uh, YouTube. So glad that you have joined with us today as well. And if we can ever include anything that you would like to share, um, you can, on Zoom, you can share that with the person who's moderating that right now, and they can share on your behalf. Or you can always email or text throughout the week, and we will include that um, next week in our service. And then those on YouTube, the same. If you would ever like to share, we just invite you to email the church office, or you can email me, um, or text me, and we will make sure to include it. At this time, I'll just come around for anybody who would like to share. Um, yeah, I missed a couple. While my knee was healing, I missed a couple of our practices up at Mendocino College, and I got back up there on Monday, and I had practiced at home. And it was just so, the music, the choral pieces that we're singing this semester are all uh, geared around peace and the hope for peace. And that's always spoken to me. And listening to the, the choir coming together and seeing their parts and hearing the music. When I left and when I got home, there was such a feeling of um, gratitude for being able to express through music what um, I feel in my heart. And, you know, that's God speaking. How meaningful. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else this morning like to share where you personally experienced God in your life this week? Well, last week uh, I have a trip to Oregon. I went through the beautiful forest and saw the renewal of the trees, and it was just um, really hopeful that our earth is continuing to renew. Indeed, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else this morning sharing where you've experienced God in a personal way that brought you hope, encouragement, peace throughout this past week? I know for me, being in Michigan, I was just there with my mom in June, and during that time I had really longed to see some cardinals, um, but because it's something that we don't see out here, having grown up in Michigan, it was one of the birds, just that bright red that, that meant a lot. And I was disappointed when I was there um, in June. This last week, um, on Thursday, when I was there helping my brother, I was on a walk and I was just prayerfully talking with God, just 
you know, talking about what had been going on and, and seeking that encouragement for myself. And all of a sudden, I was walking a path that I walked in June several times. All of a sudden, there was this cardinal that just came and it was there and it was singing with another one, kind of chatting with another one that was in a tree and just kind of flitted along the path a little bit. And I just had to pause and take a deep breath. I hadn't even expected to see one along that path. I didn't see one in June. And, and having just been prayerful, I couldn't help but remember or call to mind, oh yeah, God knew that that was something that would have been really meaningful to me, having just been here in June and um, wishing to see one. And so that was just one of those personal moments of encouragement for me throughout this past week. And um, just want to encourage you during this next week, take the time to notice around you how God is showing up in personal ways, ways to encourage you, to give you hope, and to just continue to help you to find the peace throughout the week ahead. And I appreciate when we share out loud, but it's really those things that help you to get through the week. And so just continue to take notice. I invite you now, as we continue into our service, continue to set aside those things that await you later in the week, later in the day, and just settle further into our time of worship as Bob provides our call to worship. Mm -hmm. Hear these words from Psalm 16. I will bless God who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know God is always with me. I will not be shaken, for God is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad, and I rejoice, and my body rests in safety. For you, O God, will show me the way of life granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Come and let us worship and praise God together this morning. I invite you now to listen to the ringing of the bell, after which we will stand in body or in spirit to sing number 116 in the United Methodist hymnal, The God of Abram Praise.
loving God, we have gathered this morning to offer you our thanksgiving and done praise for all that you have done for us. As we worship together today, we ask that you open our minds and souls and hearts that we may be inclined to hear the thanksgiving reflection of your spirit in our hearts. seated. And I invite you to turn to number 328 in the United Methodist Hymnal. We will sing, Surely the Presence of the Lord. We'll sing that twice. <laughs> Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with him when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later the disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. May God bless our understanding of today's word. As Jen mentioned, she asked me to um, find a video sermon we could use this morning because we weren't sure if he was going to be back in time. So uh, the sermon is from Reverend Jim Keck. Um, some of you have heard his sermons before here. We've used these. They are from First Plymouth Congregational Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, a sister United Church of Christ. And um, I hope you will um, enjoy the words that he has to bring to us today. Now, in the week after Easter, we always turn to the text of Doubting Thomas. Right after Jesus is risen, we go right to this moment of doubt. I think it's a little unfair 
we maligned him with a nickname like that because it looks sensible. He just, he didn't get to see the risen Christ yet. He just said, I'm not going to believe until I see. The other disciples didn't believe until they saw either, frankly. And so he just, but now he sees Jesus. And it's Thomas then that pronounces the highest declaration of faith in our whole gospel. Did you see it's in your hand? When he sees the risen Christ, he says, my Lord. That's the highest acclamation of faith by any of the disciples. Do you know, in the early church, in early Christianity, Thomas was considered the foremost apostle. Partly because of this declaration of faith, but, but also let me tell you about Thomas. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, He's listed as one of the 12 disciples, but he never speaks. But in the Gospel of John, he speaks three times. Three amazing moments. First, right after Lazarus was risen from the dead, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, let's now go to Judea. But the other disciples say, no, people are trying to kill you, Jesus. It's too dangerous to go there. And then Thomas says, let us go and die with him. Whoa. A willingness to die for a friend. What a disciple he is. Let us go and die with him. One of the great theologians of the church says that is the central call of the gospel. The gospel bids to us, come and die. Not die literally, meaning die to your old self. Be born anew. Die to your little versions of life and be born into a bigger understanding of life. Die to your anxieties and, and, and your lack of possibility. Die to that. Be born to what life can be really about. The gospel bids us come and die to that. I tried to convince our communications team that that would be a good marketing slogan for First Plymouth. <laughs> we put on the front page of our website, come to First Plymouth and die. <laughs> they wouldn't go for it. <laughs> but my friends, we have done that this morning. The gospel bids us come and die. Die to what is limiting the possibilities in your life. Die to what is keeping you disconnected from your brothers and sisters and disconnected from God. Die to that. Be born into something new this morning. The early church had these understandings of Thomas, so much so that we just discovered there was a gospel of Thomas written. In 1945, we discovered this gospel. Some early Christian community thought that Thomas was the primary apostle. They had a gospel of Thomas. Now, in their understanding, Thomas was Jesus' twin. Notice, notice in even our gospel of John, it says that he was called the twin. Thomas, in the Greek, he's called Didymus, which means twin. So the early Christians actually thought he was a twin of Jesus. So filled with the Spirit. The last time that Thomas talks, no, excuse me, the second time Thomas talks in the Gospel of John is, is Thomas, even how amazing he is, he, he's, he's confused. He's in this moment of not knowing the way. You've had one of those moments in your life where you don't really know what your way is, and, and he's in a state of panic. And he says to Jesus, how can I know the way? And Jesus, in this beautiful act of pastoral care, leans in and says, look at me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a beautiful moment. But actually, oddly enough, we take that moment, some Christians take that moment, to, to make the claim that Christianity is the only true religion. 
Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So some Christians think that shows Christianity is superior. And so often in this pulpit, when I talk about how much I love uh, the, the Jewish faith or, or Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, and that, and that even though Jesus is my Lord, uh, but I believe you can be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, but it, Jesus is my way, but, but those other religions have beautiful other ways. Whenever I say that, I get emails <laughs> all week long from people saying, Jesus said, no one comes to him but through, no one comes to the Father but through him. So Christianity is the one true superior religion. And then I email back. <laughs> the passage isn't talking about religion at all. Where do you see Christianity mentioned? He's not talking about religion at all. If he was talking about religion, he's Jewish. It would mean Judaism is the only way to God. He's not talking about religion. He's talking about a way of love. Well, no one relates to religion. No one gets to God except through love. And then the next time Thomas talks is here in the passage today. And then it comes to that fullest expression of faith. But notice he doubted. Now, now, some of us might imagine that doubt is the opposite of faith. But, but our text is telling us today doubt is the way to full faith. Isn't, isn't this interesting? That, that somehow Thomas, through his doubts, came to a higher level. As Kierkegaard once said, doubts are our way of taking a step back so you can jump even further forward into faith. Oh, I think this text is clearly trying to teach us. It might be your doubts that lead you to a fuller expression of hope and faith. So, I want to speak for a few moments in praise of doubt. I think it might be your doubts that, number one, your doubts can be at times a moral stance. You should doubt some things that some Christians say. You should doubt that as a moral stance. And then secondly, I think our doubts can be a way that we resist authoritarianism or tyranny or ideology. And, and I think it's our doubts, lastly, that animate the quest, get us searching and seeking. And the Christian faith is to be an adventure of seeking to know more, understand more. Let me speak now in the praise of doubt. Terry Eagleton is Mr. Smarty Pants. Terry Eagleton is one of those hip Euro literary critics. And, and because of his, perhaps his British accent, he can speak with a type of sarcasm that is so deeply condescending. He is a, a brilliant mind and he knows it full well. <laughs> he went to Cambridge, of course, read in English, but when he graduated you know, from undergrad, he pronounced right away as a young man that college is a waste of time. Seek your own truth. Learn. He made that pronouncement, but then he went on to become the youngest fellow at Cambridge since the 18th century, then went to be a professor at Oxford, of course. He's deeply professorial. But I get a kick out of what he says sometimes. I only agree with about 30% of what he says. But here's a bit that I agree with. He said, listen, he said, the world is divided into two types of people. Just two types. Those who believe too much and those who believe too little. Ooh. Terry Eagleton is a Christian, actually a vigorous defender of Christianity, so he's also talking about Christians here too. 
world is divided into two types, people that believe too much and people that believe too little. He goes on to say that fundamentalists don't understand that certainty can kill. Middle class liberals don't understand that conviction can liberate. And Mr. Smarty Pants goes on to say, the one thing that can fix this dichotomy is doubt. People that believe too much need to learn to doubt some of what they believe. People that believe too little need to doubt their doubts. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. Which one are you? According to Terry, you're one of them. You either believe too much and you should doubt some of what you're holding on to so tight, or you don't believe enough and you should doubt your doubts. Okay, I'll ask you to raise your hand when I ask which one. No, no, no. <laughs> I won't. All the great theologians throughout Christian history have known that doubt is part of the life of faith. Our Bible knows it full well. All the great paragons of faith have moments of doubt in our Bible. Doubt is part of the journey into deeper and deeper faith. The Bible is clear on it. All the theologians said, obviously faith presupposes doubts because if faith was certainty, we would call it certainty, but we don't. We call it faith. And there are some things we won't be sure about. Faith is like being in love with someone. If you're fully in love with someone, you still have doubts about how it might go or what things mean. Doubt is part of faith. So let me speak for a few moments about, well, in praise of doubt. I'm sure you have some doubts. And sometimes those doubts are an important moral stance. You should doubt some things that are proclaimed. In the name of Christ, there are some things you should doubt. So, for example, I hear Christians say all the time that the Bible is clear. Women shouldn't be teachers over men. They can quote the verse in 1 Timothy. You can go look it up. This is what the Bible is clear. And so women can't be ministers or priests. You should doubt that. The Bible is not clear at all. In the early church in Paul's epistles, clearly women are major leaders in the church. You should doubt it. They're going to one text. But throughout all of Scripture, there are female judges and prophetesses and, and proclaimers and, and female followers of Jesus and disciples. And you should doubt it as a moral stance. Doubt that claim. The Bible's not clear on that. I hear people say all the time, the Bible is clear. Being gay is a sin. I hear it all the time. I even see people in rooms just take that pronouncement like, well, yeah, the Bible must be clear about that. The Bible's not clear about that at all. You should doubt that claim. There's seven remote, arcane passages that seem to make reference to some sort of sexual behavior, but it's not clear at all what exactly it's talking about. In the Hebrew or Greek, it might mean temple prostitution. It might be some sorts of odd licentious behavior. It's not clear it's talking about sexual orientation at all. In fact, he didn't even define the word homosexuality. That word was coined in the late 1800s. And then we put it over ancient Hebrew and Greek words that it's not clear at all what they mean. When someone says it's clear what the Bible says about being gay, doubt it. Doubt it, big time. Doubt can be a moral stance. And doubt, doubt can be a way that you show the courage to resist authoritarianism. If someone's trying to tell you what to believe, sometimes doubting that is to take a stand against tyranny. Remember, do you remember? Our church, our denomination, comes from a group of doubters. Do you remember this? King Henry VIII had just formed the Church of England in the 1500s, taking the church back from Rome, formed his own church, but he kept the he kept the a lot of his own doctrines and, and church rituals. And, and there was a group in England that, that began to doubt that, that 
why do we have to believe what the king is telling us to believe? They're this authoritarian church, and they were called the Puritans. This is where our church and our denomination comes from. Then in the 1500s, as it came, came to be about 1600, there was a group of us Puritans in Yorkshire, this little village of Scrooby, and they decided that, that they doubted all that Henry VIII was saying, and they wanted to seek their religious freedom. And so with their doubts, they moved to Holland. And then it was in 1620 that that group decided they just have to, they have to leave all together to really be free. It was their doubts propelling them, and they boarded the Mayflower. This is the founding of our denomination, those Puritans on the Mayflower. That's why it's Mayflower Hall down there in Pilgrim Hall. They landed at Plymouth Rock. That's why it's called Plymouth here, a church. That's why there's a stone in our tower from Plymouth. Because this is how we began, doubting what authorities are trying to tell you, doubting tyranny or some ideology. They, they developed the notion of the freedom of individual conscience, that you don't have to take anything in faith on someone else's word, that you have a conscience. You need to come to your own understanding of God and of Christ. It's not even real faith, they said, if you believe it because someone else made you believe it. You have to claim it for yourself in the freedom of your individual conscience. We were the original doubters, Congregationalists. It propelled us to greater freedom. Use your doubts to resist ideologies to this very day. Don't just go by what other people tell you to believe. And lastly, our doubts, oh, our doubts animate the search. And faith is an adventure of seeking, seeking more knowledge, seeking to come closer to God, seeking, seeking. There's this Roman Catholic Church, I love this, in Canada. If you are standing outside this massive cathedral and the doors are open, you see hanging over the chancel from a long distance, you see a big question mark. And the idea of the architect was it should be questions that draw you in. Your doubts and questions are why we come together. But this is amazing. As you walk into that church, by the time you get halfway into the pews, you suddenly notice it's not really a question mark. It's Jesus on the cross. What a beautiful architectural statement. Your questions should draw you in, then together you can begin to more clearly see the way of love. The church I was a member at as a boy in Columbus, Ohio, it called itself the Church of the Infinite Quest. <laughs> Searching and seeking and questing and questioning together. Our doubts are what animate that. Oh, I've been speaking in praise of doubt. And I said, following Eagleton, that there are two types of people, but really, those two types of people are probably within each one of us. There's probably some things you're holding on with greater certainty than you should. You should doubt some of that. And there's probably within you some doubts that are disempowering you, disabling you. You probably have some doubts that are pretty corrosive. You should doubt those doubts. And then together, together, we will find the way of Christ. Together. <laughs>
share our joys and concerns and then spend some time in prayer together. And I'll bring the microphones around for those of you who have any joys and concerns. You'll find in our bulletin that after we share a joy together, we say, thanks be to God. And then after we share a concern together, we say, Lord, hear our prayer. And so I'll get the microphone and then bring that around for you. Are there any joys or concerns this morning that you would like to share? Our uh, daughter Tracy is with us today, and we're very happy about that. And she is also happy to say, whole and healthy. <laughs> we are happy to hear that, and happy that she is here as well. And we say, thanks be to God. Anyone else this morning? First of all, I would um, like to wish Bob a happy birthday. And so we join you in saying that happy birthday and say thanks, thanks be to God. God. Um, laying heavily on my heart right now is what is going on in um, Israel and in God the God in Gaza and um, how much it's going to affect, uh, spread out through the Middle East, the whole Middle East, and all of the innocents on both sides that are going to die because of what's going on. It's laying very heavily on my heart. I know mine as well, and I'm sure there are, many can relate here, if not all of us. And so we join you in saying, Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. Our son Jesse is going to be coming this week just for a short visit. He's uh, turning 26 next month, so he's fallen off our health care plan. So he thought, well, I better come get a few things checked before I bring him home. <laughs> so, um, he's living in Brooklyn, working in New York City, so we're glad to have him even for a short time. Indeed, and we pray for safe travels for him and the joy of having him visit. And we say thanks. Yes. So for the joy of that, we say, thanks be to God. Thank you. continue to hold her and our health journey in prayer and so join me in saying Lord hear our prayers and then I my mom and I are grateful for your prayers on behalf of my brother and his health journey um, I'm also grateful for safe travel even though there was some delays in my flight um, but just thank you for your ongoing prayers for him there was uh, some six successful outcomes last week um, that even the surgeon was very pleasantly surprised about, and so I am grateful for prayer, and so join me in saying thanks be to God, and then just please continue to keep him in prayer. Um, and then um, any others who might be traveling this week, I know that there are a few, we want to hold them in for prayer, as well as those who have other health concerns. And for all of those, we say, Lord, Lord hear our prayers. I invite you now in your own words, to take a few moments of silent prayer and reflection, and then I will lead us in prayer.
O compassionate one, hear our prayers. Prayers for hope for those who feel hopeless. Prayers for healing for those who need healing. Prayers for resources for those striving to address a need. Prayers for community for those who feel lonely. Prayers for peace for those whose lives are filled with conflict. Prayers for understanding for those seeking to be understood. Prayers for comfort for those who grieve. Prayers for food for those who hunger. Prayers for clean water for those whose water sources are contaminated. Prayers for shelter for those who are homeless. Prayers for freedom for those who live under dictatorships. Prayers for wisdom for each leader of our church. Prayers for energy and joy for each volunteer who serves on behalf of our church. And prayers for guidance and the spiritual growth and health of our church. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand now in body or in spirit and join in singing our closing hymn, number 707, Hymn of Promise.
Just know that God will be showing up in personal ways in your life, and I invite you to take notice of those personal ways that God is doing that. I invite you now to bow your head for our closing blessing. Oh God, as we leave from this place, we give our offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give our offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give our offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we also give ourselves. Go with us now as we journey throughout the week ahead. Amen. Amen. Amen.